Welcome back to The Recipe, where we start off with a tasty cocktail and lead into a tasty conversation. Today we cover a bit about tequila with Taylor, a funny story about Disney, and dive into the future of monster movies, plus how much we love Godzilla. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Recipe Boys, boys being spelled B-O-Y-Z. Reach out with any questions, comments, or topics you would like to hear, and check out the description for more info, like links to our website. Now, into the episode. Uh, I always redo the intro later, but everybody, welcome back to The Recipe, where we start off with a tasty cocktail and lead into a tasty conversation. Sing it out, New York, New York. <laughs> right. We're finally in Manhattan. Yeah, cool. Uh, what, right, what? So your hosts are back, Max, Taylor, and Lex. Um, and here we are. We are in Taylor's apartment today. And uh, Taylor has planned us a very special drink. It's going to be awesome. But uh, what's today? Today is Thursday. It's been another week since episode two. And uh, it's cooled off a little bit in New York. And we're really enjoying that life. I just think the wealthier you are, the less the heat affects you. That's what's <laughs> happening here. Yeah. We're in the more affluent area. And you know, climate change isn't going to affect you guys. So I, I, I personally think that it's because this is the upper best side, which is what I like to call the upper west side. I'm trying Boo. to make that. Yeah. Boo. I don't know. When we showed up, we did kind of talk about how like Taylor, you're right next to a nice restaurant. This is where we had dinner. Got a liquor store. Everything yeah. is right. You walk down the stairs from your apartment and you got like a shopping mall basically yeah. on your street. You were just like living the life. I like convenience. Yeah. And upper I mean, west side's got that. For I me. mean, it's funny. You sent us a menu to what we we're going to have for dinner. And the restaurant's at the base of your apartment. Yeah. Convenient. Convenient. That's what I go for. I mean, Letter you know what else editor. we can talk about today? I quit my job. Yeah. yeah Congratulations. Quit, yeah, I, yeah, it's been awesome. But I actually had to take all my stuff home today, and I took it out in that cardboard box that you see in all the movies and TV mm-hmm. shows, and literally every single person I saw in the elevator, on the way out, in the lobby, when I was waiting for my Uber, everyone remarked, like, your choice or not. Wow. No, people were up front. They had no problem. And I was it's like, New York wow. for you. I, I always wonder what it'd be like when I finally leave this place. Is it going to look like it looks in the movies? And it, it was exactly what it looked like. Mm-hmm. That's I, great. Yeah. Lex is going full time podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's quitting to do this full time. <laughs> Hedging all my bets, guys. Right. You better listen or yeah. else I'm broke. Join it, the Patreon right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because we're not going to quit our jobs. So you're just going to be like a full time podcaster waiting for us to get out of work. Clarification I'm not quitting my job to podcast. Important to know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although you still do the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I might not be here next week. I might be broke. Can't afford to come. <laughs> Can't afford. <laughs> you don't got that podcast. Lex is gonna yet. have to dial in. <laughs> yeah. <I'm, I'm, laughs> <no. laughs> my company paid my phone. I got no phone now. I'm mean, penniless with no phone. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't wait to start the new gig. It's on Monday. I can't wait. That's exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna miss you, all man. you guys. We'll so, see you next week. <laughs> yeah, see you next week. Right. Taylor, what's your week been like? I want to hear you talk. Uh, a great week. Uh, had a big, uh, big thing at work. I don't know how much I'm supposed to say about that. I guess I can say a release. You know, that's important. I got a release it's too. Uh, where's okay. the, where's I got a release. The, I, you're gonna get a HR call from that one. Yeah. <laughs> My release is I walked in. As soon in. as I said it, I was just like, "Oh, that's a really bad thing to say." <laughs> it's perfect for us. We need the content. Okay. No, <laughs> I walked into Taylor's apartment. Never been here. It's a beautiful apartment, very Manhattan, and I breathed a nice sigh of relief and release when I noticed my bathroom was still nicer. <laughs> yeah. The apartment's nicer, but my bathroom wins, so I can take that petty win. I like your bookshelf. Thank you. You've read all the books I've given you, so that's great. Yes. I definitely, definitely don't just have books on my shelf that I didn't read. (laughs) I like how it looks. Honestly, if I was describing this apartment to anyone, it's kind of like if you took the apartments in Friends and made them real, like adjusted for the New York economy. Right. Yeah. 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 I think that we should do that. I'd like the there to be a segment at some point, maybe like when we splinter off and you create your own podcast, hmm. which is just you. You are rating, doing full time now. Re, yeah. Now, now he's doing full time <laughs> uh, doing just rating apartments by like comparing it to what did you say your your apartment was, which uh, was the Rainforest Cafe Met American Psycho. Yeah, it's just such a wild thing. To well, say. It's like really modern. But then I have a shit ton of tropical plants and I want it to be based. And you wonder why I chose Godfather. You need more plants. I'll be honest. Like for that aesthetic you're going for. I want some more. I want more my father was discouraging me and i'm like i now know it. if we plant kudzu it'll take over there you go <laughs> yeah man. you ever had a de- lex when was, when was when was your last desk pop <laughs> like, like, taylor we, we've all done it what was your last desk pop i don't know 
September 09. <laughs> a what? A desk pop. What's a desk pop? <laughs> you fucking for real, man? <laughs> You're supposed to know movies and TV. It's from the other guys. Will we, Ferrell. we pay you zero dollars oh to God. know this stuff. Yeah, you're right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, no, Money's I didn't see it. It's funny because it's like this is one of those movies that at the time I didn't even know anyone ever saw, and then years later everyone's like, "Oh, it's an incredibly great quotable movie." It's phenomenal. My favorite line, I think, almost blacked out in the theater when they when they when they showed it, was when they found the the, the, the like the green car. Like, remember he had like a really econ- I didn't see the movie. <laughs> what are you looking at me he for? He had an environmentally friendly car, and and they I think what was it like? It was a hybrid. He had a hybrid car. Will Ferrell's like nerd character. And they were like, we. Is it a Prius? Sto- it got sto- it was a Prius, and it got stolen. And they said, we found your car. It was trying to vote for Ralph Nader. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great. That's gonna be one of the best jokes in cinema. And I, I almost blacked out. All right, I might actually see that. <laughs> if, if, if you were a tuna and I was a lion, I would swim out into the ocean and eat you. You were really gonna swim out an eight hundred pound tuna, <laughs> a lion. <laughs> that's the funniest thing about that whole movie. It's probably one of the best conceived jokes of all time. But also, it's really sad to report. The whole joke of Eva Mendez's character, the whole joke, the whole joke was that Eva Mendez was so unattractive to Will Ferrell, like he could not stand her. He thought he was she was overbearing and the old ball and chain, and he kept pushing her away when she was trying to kiss him. And Mark Wahlberg is like, "Oh my God, your wife is so hot!" And he's like, "Oh, well, you know, she's whatever. And she wore that and whatever." And she's like, <laughs> slamming skin tight dress, stilettos. I'm gonna be honest. Before you meet my wife. She looks pretty shitty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole joke, every single scene, he's like degrading her and being, and he's a really nice character and he's just a huge dick to this wife who's beautiful. And it's real, and she's like obsessed with him. But they play into the joke, all hot girls love him. Yeah, every, like, hot, every girl. hot girl's like looking at him and eyeing him oh and wanting him. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like the biggest dork. Yeah. It's Will Ferrell playing the biggest dork he's ever played. Uh, and it was amazing. And then since then, we haven't seen Eva Mendez again. <laughs> like she's just too busy having Ryan Gosling's babies. Did she? Oh, is it her and Ryan she's, Gosling. Yeah. yeah, she's had a lot of babies. Going to be some good looking kids. The funny thing is, people don't really. I don't feel like they get like the Brad and Angelina, the you know the Jen and Ben, you know the Benifer shit. Like they don't get talked about. Eh, probably because they're happy. Well, I mean, it's probably because they're happy. <laughs> They don't live in the Upper Best Side. Oh, uh, they didn't, might. Didn't. I don't know. Angelina there Jillian are Brad some Pitt celebrities like around. Up they did, but they keep they kept the winery, so don't worry. The oh, kids, yeah. whatever, but they kept the winery together. They both co-own the winery. Did they he, give the kids back to the countries they took them from? Oh, or they, God, I got that. Brad put his kids back, and <laughs> Angelina kept hers, and she's gonna give them to Marvel. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> canceled. <laughs> we're canceled, guys. We didn't even get on the air. We're canceled. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, okay, so I'm waiting to drink this drink, so why don't yeah. we, uh, in case you guys don't know, we, uh, I made margaritas, um, so before we say anything else, let's just do a little, cheers, help. clack, that's a strong margarita. yeah, that's how I like them, it just tastes like a margarita to me, yeah, it tastes like tequila with lime and salt, and I love that, that's what's in it, well, is there that, ocean water in this, it's very salty, it should be, right, well, you put, oh uh, yeah, so, at the request of uh, Lex, I, I did uh, coarse sea salt on the rim. And I thought it was going to be a little salty, but okay. I'm um, happy about it. Yeah. It's a good way to have it. It's a quality margarita. Can, so, I, can I just say this real quick? I'm drinking, maybe, it, I'm, we, drink, I'm drinking out of a mug that Taylor seemed to own that says, and I quote, happiness is a warm pussy. <laughs> now, for those who don't know, um, and I don't know if I'm going to get, I don't know if everyone's going to love this, but uh, this is my grandfather's glass so he passed away so show some respect I but respect the shit out of this are you kidding me you'd love him he, he was, was a fan yeah. of cats big deal yeah was, no so actually yeah actually a warm pussy is a whiskey drink that no one drinks anymore because obviously it's got a terrible name but That's apparently it was name. Yeah. i would order one but can we go to a bar one day and try to order a warm pussy and see if someone makes it for us uh yeah yeah we could definitely do that <laughs> i mean you can order it you can try i guess but you know what we could do? You can know what we could do is do that. When they look at us weird, put the glass on the That's table. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Great minds. That way. Yeah, right. Um, no, but it's a great glass, and he'd, he'd, uh, he'd love to hear that you were I'm a drinking, big fan. Drinking from it. Um, okay. So we're drinking margaritas. Um, just to get the official stuff out of the way, the IBA, the International, International? Beverage Association? I think it's Bartender Association. This might be the Rolodex that I infamously mentioned in episode two. Yeah, right, right, right. It is the International Bartender Association um, says that the official margarita has seven parts tequila, four parts Cointreau, 
three parts lime. Personally, what I do usually is I do two parts tequila, one part Cointreau, one part lime, partially because I like that combination, but also it's easier to do. Um, so it's and, two ounce, one ounce, one ounce? Yeah, basically. But then I add in like a little more tequila, a little more Cointreau to taste. Did you uh, did you use Cointreau? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, you got to go Cointreau. Cointreau's great. Yeah. No Grand Marnier for you? No. That's just what I use. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one time, like as I've, like I said before, I've gotten really into cocktails lately and getting more into it, especially since the podcast. But you got a surprise for next week. You never know. Anyways, uh, Max loves to spend money. Yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, like one time I was going to Taylor's Beach House and he was like, "We can make margaritas," and I was like, "I'll bring a fuck ton of limes." And I brought a back b- bag full of limes. Yeah, yeah. My my a- actual instructions to him was specifically to bring a fuck ton of limes, and he came through. We had limes for the rest of the summer. It was great. <laughs> We're like the best friends for stuff like that. Yeah. You know, people people come with like two limes. No, what the hell is with that? Fuck limes limes is like ice. It's something that like oh, you, you never, never really can have enough. Oh my god, you're so right. Yeah. Every party, it's like you don't have to bring just fucking bring ice because you'll be the coolest guy in the room. Ah, hey, I don't even know if you meant to do that. That's pretty good. Um, I'm feeling yeah. it tonight, Veronica. So the other thing about the the margarita is it's super good at like it's a pretty flexible drink. You know, everyone's probably had some weird version of a margarita. Mango margaritas, pomegranate, all that stuff. They love to mix that up. And, you know, it's a good one to do it. Um, one of the things that I thought was really cool is that that same International Beverage Association, the IBA, declare or state that it's a all day drink. So they have special like categories for drinks. Like a Manhattan is a, you know, pre dinner drink or like post dinner. Cause or, it's an aperitif cause it has a, a digestif in it. Right. But you know, I think they know what we know uh, personally already that margarita is something you can drink all day. And let me tell you, can't like drink it. all day if you don't start in the morning. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I'd tell you another story about a margarita. It was, it was when my brother surprised me for my birthday, you guys were there. And we went out to Stone Street in New York City, and it was Claire or somebody who had ordered the Margarita Tower. Oh, yeah. Oh, and Mad Dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah and just f- that did my brother in. Like, yeah. He, he's a big dude, but he's not like a New York drinker. He's more of a Bud Light kind of guy. Yeah, but him and I were the ones that finished that motherfucker. The thing no, is, was, by the two of them. We had no, two, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. We did the have thing two, thing is, and Johnny a, swore that me and Mitchell couldn't finish it. And we fucking killed that guy. But we, because he just poured, it's a margarita tower, so you just, one after the yeah. other, down we, it. We did the math, I think it's like 30 margaritas or something. It's between it's 20 a lot. and 30. It's a lot. Depending on the amount of ice they put in it. I mean, I know that's impressive, but one time, Claire, me, Claire, and Vince did it alone, plus a little Andrew Cassetti at the end, so, I mean, that's but that's real crazy By the time we went that. to that, like, fancy cocktail bar. Yeah, he was gone. Oh, yeah, Michigan. What cocktail bar did we go to? The one on top of the, the little pier thing. Come well, on, Blacktail. Blacktail. Yeah, yeah, we drove by it, yeah, yeah. Uh, today and uh yeah he was fucked yeah and he talks about it still He's if like, we oh, ever fuck. if we ever make it big we gotta have an episode in blacktail that's my favorite think fucking bar us? oh it's my favorite too it's, it's my amazing. favorite bar in the whole city well don't tell everyone because then they're all gonna go they're it's already there go. it's fucking packed <laughs> well, it's fucking packed. It, just, it also has like that aesthetic it looks cool it's fun to be there it's kind of a speakeasy because it's like at the side there's entrance. like that one like suited yeah. up bald owner walking around hey everybody doing you know, yeah like, you know shaking people's hands what does he do hey everybody i wish it's not a visual medium but uh, I was gonna say I I've booked so many open table reservations at Blacktail that I get preferred open table. Really? Yeah. So I get like to book earlier than other people, and I can like jump. They, they have like I think they have like a VIP amount of tables that they list that go towards the restaurant if they don't get taken. For example, so say they have ten tables and they're gonna put eight on open table, maybe two of those eight are for preferred people, and if they don't go. They go back to the restaurant's regular seating chart, mm-hmm. and I get preferred. I go there. I booked. I think I booked like six reservations there over the past like year and a half. Wow! Because every time it's a really good place. The difference is if you don't reserve, and I'm sorry for taking up your margarita, but if you don't reserve, uh, open table. If you don't reserve a table at Mar- at Blacktail and you stand, you don't get the daiquiri. But yeah. They give you a free daiquiri when you sit down. Daiquiri, it's kind of like a margarita. Daiquiri is basically a margarita it's with rum. So interesting story. The one of the stories of the possible origin of the tequila or the tequila of the margarita was that there was this guy named Rusty, and they refer to him in the Wikipedia article about Margarita as um, a, a party-goer named Rusty something or other. Get out of yeah. here, Rusty! Yeah. He's banned from that bar. <laughs> oh, call back to that great joke. 13 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So he he basically was trying to make daiquiris, but ran out of rum, and they were just like doing tequila. But that's the one that I think everyone knows is just like bullshit. That did no, not. No, that's got to be no. But if that is the story, like if, if like I like in, to imagine that Ru- the man named Rusty was involved. No, but that's the most margarita version of that story. Like someone drinking a margarita came up with that story. If it is fake, yeah, it was also like not. It was like a decade after people were already drinking them, but they just like went back in time. They're like, yeah, let's say Rusty did it. I do maintain that daiquiri. And the planter's punch, which is basically the daiquiri as well, uh, I mean, is an offshoot of the daiquiri motto, is basically the most perfect cocktail. You take your citrus, take your booze, you take a little bit of sweetener, you know, sour, you know, one of sour, one of sweet, one of strong, one of weak. That's the most perfect combination. So interestingly enough, one of the reasons why people say that uh, margaritas are so popular is that in addition to those things, the sour and the sweet, you also get salty because people put the salt around the rim on that. And they think that that hits more flavor sectors on the tongue. And that's one of the reasons why they think it's amazing. And if you don't do that, you're a salty bitch. Yeah. I actually don't do salt usually, but you man. know, I always do salt. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm a little jealous now. I, I like, like my sweet and savory. You've always ordered them without salt pretty much. Right? Yeah, pretty much. I like yeah. my sweet and savory. If I could put salt in the daiquiri, I'd do it too. You can do whatever you want, man. No one's going to stop you. Let's start doing that. Salted but daiquiris. You start. <laughs> you I, I bet if I go to Blacktail, they'd, your oyster. I bet if I went to Blacktail, they'd be like, wow, I see you. I, see. <laughs> I feel like they'd recognize like real recognize real. They'd be like, whoa, this guy's on to some shit. I bet if Vince did it, it would it would go over really well. If Vince does anything, it's going to go over real well. Yeah, that's shit. one of our friends. Shout out to not. Vince. We miss you. Yeah, we do miss you. Vince. I actually mentioned you yesterday. Um, okay, let's keep talking about uh, the Margs. Um, actually, let's go a little bit to tequila. Definitely. Just tequila in general. Um, first and most important fact I've got here, Lex used to not drink tequila. You're right. You were really against. Do you have Do you have a comment on that, Lex? Nobody's perfect. Only God is perfect. (laughs) (laughs) No, um, I make mistakes. Uh, I only drank really shitty tequila, and I drank a lot of tequila at my friend's 21st birthday party, and I was 21, and I threw up for days. And I thought the smell of tequila made me throw up, but really it was just really cheap tequila. Yeah. And that's one of the things I think gets gets a bad rap because we're going to talk a little bit more about my dad and. Um, his signature drink a little later, but he never drank tequila because he always associated with like Jose Cuervo, which, you know, is okay. It's not terrible, but I think that's one of the ones that people end up getting sick on or they drink too much of and they have those shooters. So, um, so most people think, you know, people know the combination of mezcal and tequila and they know that they're related. Um, so tequila is actually a type of mezcal, not the other way around. A lot Mm -hmm. of people get that confused. Mezcal is basically any agave based um, liquor. Barely um, know her. Tequila, though, specifically is 100% blue agave. If it is not 100% blue agave, it is not tequila. And do you guys know why tequila is like champagne? Other because, than the fact that it's amazing. Because it needs to come from tequila, Mexico. It has to come from the surrounding area of, yeah, exactly. So where's, so, it, where's it grown in Mexico? Or so, like the, the plant and stuff? The, the blue agave plant, um, I think, grows in other places, but the tequila region is specifically really great for it because it has this volcanic rock kind of uh, yeah. soil, and apparently that's like the best place in the world to grow these things. And Had so a-, a few years ago, they decided, I mean, probably 30, 40 years ago, yeah. they decided that it's like, if it's not grown here, it can't legally be called tequila. They have the same thing with cognac. It can't be called cognac unless it's... Uh, made in Cognac, France. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a really good experience with tequila. We were on vacation in Cancun, and we went to into Cancun, went to Chechen Itzca to see the pyramids. We also take a stop in Valladolid, and it's just like a it was a Spanish settlement, and uh, there's a lot of like tequila shops there. But it's not like you walk in; it's all branded stuff. It's all just like bottled up, homemade, basic basic tequila. They have all these different blends of like coconut tequila, all this different stuff. And we ended up buying just like it didn't have a brand name; it was just it was just coconut tequila and they let us try a bunch of different flavors and stuff in the shop. Cause drinking tequila there is a much different experience than going to some like downtown college bar, you know, like mm-hmm. the stuff that'll just make you it's, feel sick. It's like lavish, right? It's yeah, like yeah. looked at as like a, a but it's like, they're like tasting different yeah. whiskeys or something, you know? Yeah. And then, uh, the, we, we bought, a it was like a hundred pesos for this bo- bottle of What's that an American hundred pesos. Hold on. Let's take a look. But, uh, got a just, just to talk about hundred pesos to confirm it was only like $5. And I bought this little tiny bottle. It's about this big, but it's made for like just like what a hundred milliliters or something like that. Yeah, it wasn't. It's just made like for, a sake, like a sake basically for tasting. 
And it was just really cool coconut tequila that we uh, finished off in Mexico at the, the resort. I have an interesting theory. Go ahead. Similar to how you can't call it tequila unless it's made in the region surrounding tequila, Mexico, cognac. You can't make it unless it's cognac, France. I don't think a Tim Mason is a Tim Mason unless it's enjoyed in the vicinity or the same uh, drinking establishment as a Mason. It, otherwise, you're just drinking a tequila and cranberry. Does it wine. count if you send a picture to one of the Masons? No. And tell them you're no. drinking it? See, no. so I'm going to disagree with that because of the fact that we want to get the Tim Mason National. We want to get that drink in every bar in the United States. And you know you have the first way you do that? Yeah. My advertising degree would tell you make it exclusive. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to drop creds on okay, you. Okay, I got this. We got a whole, I got a whole, like, I'm seeing what you're seeing now, I think. Yeah. We're going to whole thing on Instagram, a whole campaign. It's going to be like us drinking the Tim Masons. And it's going to be like hashtag you get, fl- you get flown out so people can say, oh, this is the official Tim Mason. You can't have it without being here. You have to be with a Tim Mason. Got to come to the Upper West Side or out to Or Long the Island. Upper West Side's <laughs> got to come to you. Yeah, right, <laughs> you right. You got to be like, oh, I'm going to fly to Dallas, Texas so we can do a Tim Mason event. Yeah. So um, I guess cut to the chase then. Uh, my uh, my father, Tim Mason, the the OG, um, he gin and tonic guy for basically my entire life. He goes to his best friend's uh, Cinco de Mayo party, and they had tequila shots, but it was like sipping tequila, like real nice stuff, good top shelf tequila, and he just walked away and he just absolutely loved it just his favorite thing in the world. And so what he started drinking is a drink we now call the Tim Mason, which is tequila and cranberry with basically like a lot of lime. Like it's supposed to be two limes. Um, but uh, so yeah, it's it's tequila and cranberry, 50-50, two limes. And 50-50? So it's like two ounces of tequila, two ounces of cranberry? Well, I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, or one ounce tequila, I'm, one ounce like cranberry. Like I said, Tiki's big on measuring. Right, so I'm coming from that school. So if I'm making a Tim Mason, right, and I'm making it put in a recipe book, it's gonna be two ounces of tequila, two ounces of lime. I mean, two ounces of tequila, two ounces of cranberry, and then as much lime as the bar permits. Uh, generally about two. Two, two lime two, wedges? Two lime wedges. Are they squeezed or they just left to hang in? He the squeezes drink? them in. Gotcha. He likes them on the glass, and then he squeezes it himself. He likes to know how much lime is in there. But like everything else, you know? Yeah, but let's just say you, let's just say you owned a flagship restaurant. Let's say you were like Margaritaville with like Jimmy Buffett. I wish that I was. Yeah, that like, would be so amazing. That's also like, that's, I've had a I have a, a terrible story about Margaritaville. Which that's I'll a, share that's a time. dream job for you. It's like being the provocateur of like a flagship liquor focused restaurant chain. I gotta get cards that say provocateur on that. That's a great. That's such a wonderful thing to say. It's a very Tim Mason thing to say. <laughs> so I don't know. I think I'm feeling the Tim Mason in the room. Yeah, but no, um, I, I don't was, know if you'd love say, that. Like, how would you? If I'm writing a bar book and I'm putting the Tim Mason in there, what's it? Two lime wedges, squeeze. Yeah. Um, you know, I still think that there is like a, a kind of a step to it that the person does. So like that's their job. You put the lime on the side of it and then they put it in. How pedestrian. I love it. I'm yeah. kidding. I'm kidding. I don't know how pedestrian. I feel like that's I feel like it's like, you know, kinda like a little I think it's a little bit of like a little activity that you do. You no, know, I love it. I think a little I think interactivity in I, your drink. People like a good theme. Good theme, yeah. And this theme is is waspy tequila drinks. Little interactive here. Yeah, we'll have one later and talk more about it. I cannot it, but wait. I, I've never had a Tim Mason. I've had a lot of drinks with cranberry in it. I really enjoy Tim Masons. Yeah. You, it's, well, it sounds Masons. weird now, we're saying, the way we're saying it. Let's call them Tim Masons. One no, 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 no. Let's just call it Tim Masons. I was introduced it. I, was introduced I mean, it. there was a drink called a warm pussy at one point. So, <laughs> so the big deal of Tim Masons are. Yeah. yeah. There, oh, there is. My, you want to you know my favorite drink name if we're going to talk about liquor? There's a drink called a Col- Colorado Bulldog. It's marketed as like the worst sounding drink in the entire world. Like it was invented to sound disgusting, right? And we used to have competitions when I was a bartender and server to try to sell a Colorado Bulldog because we assumed that no one would ever take the bait. But if you actually think about it, this drink is delicious. Might be one of my favorite drinks ever made that have vodka in it. It is basically a white Russian. So it's vodka, Kahlua, and Bailey's, it's vodka, Kahlua, Bailey's with milk. And then you add a spritz from the gun of Coke, which as we know has a lot more syrup than a regular Coke if you pour it from the, from the glass. The spritzer has a lot more syrup and a lot more carbonation. And then you take that and you, you shake it. 
And believe it or not, it tastes like a very boozy Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee. That's like the uh, white lips. Russian milkshakes at the, Alamo. It's, oh my God. The black and white cookie milkshakes? Yes, sir. Those are good. The spiced rum. Uh, one thing I thought was kind of interesting is that um, the blue agave plant, which is what this uh, delicious, delicious drink uh, is is made of, um, it's pollinated not just by insects, as most things are, but also by bats. So if you don't like bats, then get you the fuck out. So get the fuck out of here. Batman, a fan of tequila based drinks? I no, because he's a really pussy. Makes sense. He's a warm pussy. <laughs> I mean, he probably likes that, too. Um, another cool thing about it is that um, there's kind of a little bit of a secret sauce to how to make it, how to, how to you know, collect the agave. And uh, these secrets are passed down by generations. And the people who do this, the farmers of the agave, are called, and I'm going to butcher this, Jimidoros. Can I see it? Jimidoros. 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 There you go. Yeah. Jimidoros. Um, I'm probably gonna, I'm gonna butcher it. I'm gonna butcher it too because my accent is awful. No, it's Himadores. It's Himadores. Himadores. You gotta roll the, roll the R. You gotta roll the R. Himadores. Himadores. I don't think you pronounce it as a separate syllable, R E S. But either way, I could be wrong. We'll talk about it in our podcast. It's about pronunciating. Pronunciation. <laughs> Next I mean, episode. Th- this, this Next sound- episode. Grammar. This, Study up. Th- this sound <laughs> right here that's gonna be edited in is how it's pronounced. El Himador. There you go. That's how it's pronounced. But you didn't say it though. Edit it in. I'm gonna put like a computer voice. Oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's gonna be like one of the Himadoras. Google, Google Translate. Himadores. Yeah. <laughs> um, and finally, um, the third Saturday of March is National Tequila Day in Mexico. All right. So, fun fact: a little, little five minute spiel for us. I saw this thing on the internet. Everybody loves the internet, but apparently in 1986. Um, when they were doing the movie, um, it was the movie we all know and love. It was called the, the Great Mouse Detective. Remember that one? Um, it was originally called from the animators and the artists called Basil of Baker Street, and uh, that's like the creative name. Oh, Sherlock Tyan. Yeah. So uh, um, he, is, he lives in the same house as Sherlock Holmes. Oh, is that what the point is? In the movie, he's, I didn't see it. It's, it's, yeah, so it's, it's a, the same. This is one of the very two few one B like, Baker Street, in, but. The, the animators got pissed because the executives are like, no, it's going to be called the Great Mouse Detective because it's a very direct name. People understand it. So what happened was the animators sent around a memo. They renamed all the old Disney classics to what essentially happened to this movie to kind of make fun. And the executives got like super pissed. If this went to the CEO of Disney and he demanded to find out who wrote this memo, but none of the animators ever squealed. So it just kind of existed and it was funny. So we're going to play a game. I'm going to read the titles of these movies where the animators are making fun of them. And then Taylor or Lex have to buzz in by hitting the table and telling us what the original movie was. Um, And I'll start at the top. And Lex is cleaning a beer on the ground right now. So I have any advantage. So let's do this. All right. So movie number one. Why would you spill your beer, Taylor? The title of this movie is Seven Little Men Help a Girl. Snow White. Lex got it. Next one. The Wooden Boy Who Became Real. Pinocchio. <laughs> got it. One to one. Color in music. Mary Poppins? I think so. There's no answers. Oh, <laughs> colors in music? Color in music. Color the sound music. of music. Oh, Fantasia. Of that's Fantasia. It's colors in music. Oh, oh that's Fantasia. probably. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, okay. Fantasia. Give him, give him I should probably know the I answers. I two points for that no, shit. There's no <laughs> answers here for me, so I can't really tell. The wonderful elephant who could really Gumbo. fly. Oh, come on. You pressed it before you knew, knew what it was. I knew, but he said elephant. You, I knew it. You said, he said How wonderful when you pressed it. Elephants? All right. There's a right. Bring it back. Dumbo. Bring it back. Bring it back. Okay, Bring so it back. Cheat. Cheater um, over here. The Three little, to one. The little deer. His who, hand's already on the, the thing. The little deer who grew up. Here you go. Go ahead. Bambi. Yeah. <coughs> take yeah, that. Take Bambi. that. Uh, the girl with see-through shoes. Cinderella. Yes. The girl in the imaginary world. Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> the Amazing Flying Children. I don't know. <laughs> Peter Pan. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, it's I got to feel. Family Feud. I, I, just, well, I, have to, I have to hit it so fast. That's the problem. <laughs> you need like an actual we buzzer. We need an actual buzzer here. That's the thing. Um, you need one buzzer. I'm going to write a Apparently program. Apparently, Jeopardy has a delay on their buzzers. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> so you have to buzz in earlier than you're seeing in the film. In the, I, mean, in the, I mean, let's say editing it tighter. They have a delay. All right. Jeopardy. Uh... Two dogs fall in love. Lady, Lady and Tramp. Tramp. Yeah, I yeah, got that, that was one. My, my Fuck out of here. The girl who seemed to die. 
<laughs> Do you know who it is? The girl who what? What is it? The girl who seemed to die. The girl who seemed to die. Oh, man. You don't know this? I don't know. What is it? Snow White. Oh. She ate an apple and fell asleep. That's Come on. Slut. No, Sleeping Beauty. You mean Sleeping Beauty. But she was already asleep. They didn't think she did. No, no. Oh, no, I guess the, she did. No way they buried her. It's no way they gave her like flowers. She had, had a funeral, a funeral and everything. Funeral and yeah. everything. You're right. Okay, the, the it is ho- no the way. The host of this sh- this this part. You is know, right. you could guess these also because you don't know the answers. But I'm I'm, I'm reading them pre in my mind. Know, yeah, but they're supposed to be so obvious and an idiot could get it. <laughs> this one, a this, caveman. Could this do one's it. really good. Puppies taken away. <laughs> oh, I got it. 101 Dalmatians stolen. <laughs> Can't steal it. Oh, this one's easy. I'll uh, swallow the, my margarita. The boy, <laughs> the boy who would be king, King Arthur. No, oh, um, uh, the sword, sword and stone. stone. Sword and stone. Yeah, yeah. You like the sword and the stone? I love it. Oh man, as a kid, you know what really got me? You're so old. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, shut up. As a kid, you know what really got me is that scene. I always felt so bad for the girl squirrel. Remember when he gets turned into a squirrel and this girl squirrel. Oh, she loves him. Falls in yeah. love with the kid. Do they, King they, Arthur. They do the same thing in the new Will Smith movie when he turns into a pigeon and the new pigeon's like. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, they're just reusing jokes now? Dude, that's basically what it Disney. is. Disney. Come not, on, no, man. It's DreamWorks. It's DreamWorks that's doing it. Remember? Because it's Tom Holland plays like a nerdy character who's like the Q for a spy agency and turns Will Smith's super spy into a pigeon. And there's another pigeon who just happens to be in the area. Oh, so this is just flat joke theft. Basically, this is a movie that the trailer's out. The movie what's, hasn't come out yet. What's the statute of limitation on, on None these of it. kinds of You can things. steal any joke. It's just supposed to be like a respect thing. Yeah. Right. All right. So the next movie is... Wait, you were still the two movies? But there's a few more. Just a few. A boy, a bear, and a big black cat. It's a jungle book. Correct. What is the score now? Is it like 7-3? I think Alex is winning. Um, next cheats. <laughs> <laughs> score, the points don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Aristocats. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that really on the list? Yeah, because that's that's gold. Whoever wrote this list is deserves a raise, not to get fired. They should be on the podcast. They if you wrote this them. memo, you don't have to come forward. Just come hang out with us. Yeah, like that. Oh, that title makes sense. Okay, um, we're in the Upper West Side. Next one is Robin Hood with animals. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, Hood. is it Robin Hood? Yeah. <laughs> God, this is good. Uh, to my save a girl. Oh, Rescuers Down Under or yeah. Rescuers. Yeah, either one. Yeah. Yeah. Or Cinderella. <laughs> this, mm, uh, okay, yeah. It's uh, and, and, but we Partial credit. Partial credit. credit. That's funny. Because there's more than one, two mice. There's too many uh, mice in Disney. <laughs> Disney has too many mice. Uh, what is... Oh, yeah, I guess I mean, <laughs> that's their thing. Okay. It all started with a mouse. It all started with a mouse. <laughs> the next one is A Fox and a Hound are Friends. Fox yeah. and a Hound. Yeah, okay. got it. Okay. And the last We're, one, I actually don't know. The, the Evil Bonehead? The Evil Bonehead? Is this a skeleton dance? Remember they had nah. the skeleton dance that won all the uh, the awards because it was like with music. I don't think that was Disney. Not Evil sure. Boy. That must have been. That Listeners, been tweet us what that answer is. We don't. know. Yeah. That. Oh my god. No, this is yeah, gonna kill me. That was all in recourse to the Great Mouse Detective. Oh, that was uh, great. Because okay. it was gonna be called um, Basil on Baker Street. Um. Um. Anyways, uh, today, uh, this episode, um, as of now, is called Monsters and Margs, and you're probably wondering why we called it Monsters, but we, today we want to talk about the future of monster movies. Than the cinematic universes that they belong, and the and, and the past of monsters. the past, correct, and because that's where they all stem from. Um, but first, we want to start on a high note and talk about Godzilla, because as far as the new Godzilla goes, I fucking love that movie for more more than one reason. Also appropriate for another reason, King of the Monsters. Exactly. So uh, the first Godzilla come out the new the new reboot Godzilla basically come out and. Uh, the really dark one. It was all right. It's, it did well in uh, 2014. 2014. It did well, but it's, you know, very dramatic story based. There's only like eight minutes of Godzilla on screen, something like that. And uh, what I really like what they did with that movie is they actually kind of listened to the fans and they were like, hey, we want more Godzilla and monsters. Like, stop talking about people. We don't, we, there's tons of movies with people. So this new release of Godzilla, King of the Monsters, it's basically just all Godzilla fighting monsters. And monsters fighting people. And the, it, the, the drama of the people just kind of didn't matter. And I loved that. And people fighting people. I liked it a lot. It's a really well-made film. I think it deserved more praise than it got. Did you see the original designs for Ghidorah? Uh, for this production? Yeah. No. So Ghidorah, anyone can look up blind on the, the concept art for Ghidorah, which they were going, because if you don't know the history of Ghidorah, spoiler alert, 
he's not actually a monster that originates from Earth. He's it's a an monster. Alien. He's an alien that comes from space. And they do that in the movie too. Yep. And uh, he was originally going to look really like a alien, s- alien salamandry looking thing, but they just kind of said, you know, as cool as this concept is, we're just gonna, you know, make him look like Ghidorah <laughs> and yeah. just go with it. And I think that was the best decision they ever made because. If we've learned anything through like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, anything like that, is it like staying close to the source material is actually a good idea. Yeah, because you got to imagine that it's like the people who that are the reason why you're bringing back this property are the ones that are going to be the harshest critics. So it's like, oh, well, let's make a new version that's going to appeal to a new generation. It's like, no, no, no. They're not the ones that are getting this movie put back in the theaters. It's the diehard fans. Like my cousin Ian, who's a huge, huge Godzilla fan. Well, it, if, even if you're not a Godzilla fan, if you just like cool CGI monsters fighting each other, this movie will make you a Godzilla fan. Because um, if you throw back to, uh, what was the Godzilla movie with the worm guy? It was terrible. In America? Yeah, the worm. The, oh, Godzilla from 2009? Or no, 1999? Yeah. Like Roland Emmerich Godzilla. Yeah, it was where Godzilla was purely like animalistic and only wanted to make babies and feed in New York and the worm guy in New York. Oh, uh, he trashed Matthew the garden. Broderick. Matthew Broderick. The garden. How to kick down the garden? Yeah. yeah. In any ways, all these California actors using fucking stereotypical New York accents. So yeah. basically, a little history on that movie: when they actually licensed Godzilla, the American production of whoever did it, I can't name it, um, they redesigned Godzilla, and they were going to present back to the Godzilla team in Japan, basically. But like, here's our design of Godzilla, and what they said originally, like the, the Japan team was like, "Don't change him too much. Here's what you can do." But you know, and they ignored everything they asked them to do. And they made this crazy looking off the wall, more lizard like Godzilla. And when they showed it to the Japanese team, apparently there was just complete silence in the boardroom. No one said a thing. And uh, the Japanese team kind of, um, uh, you know, regrouped because they've already licensed the material. Like they have it. They're going to make this movie. And they said, we're not going to make any changes to your Godzilla. And basically, out of disrespect, is because we can't. This is terrible. There's nothing we can do with this. We can't fix it. We can't fix it. So wow. they just let them do it. And uh, they gave up. And, and they were wrong because obviously that movie was incredible <laughs> and everyone loved it. That's there was really no funny. problem. So 10 funny. out of 10. No notes. So what's crazy is like there was actually pre planned for a second you know, installment because after the movie ended, there was like that foreshadowing with the, the baby. The, the baby that comes out of yep. the egg. And the whole. Yeah, but he's a Nick fan. So he's going to hang out. <laughs> So the he's p- a sailor. He's from New York. <laughs> we got him late. <laughs> so the, the the plot of Godzilla two was going to be where this baby imprints on Nick on Nick. You got to say his last name. Broderick. No. <laughs> no. No. What's what's his character's his name? Character's name is Nick Tatopoulos. Oh, is A very, a okay, very right, easy yeah. to pronounce name, but or there's a running gag in the movie for anyone remembers. Where no one can pronounce his last oh. name. They're, like, they're reading from, from the paper, Nick Tatopoulos. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, Nick Tatopoulos. And everyone's acting like he has the most difficult name to pronounce. Seems pretty easy to roll off the tongue. I really liked when uh, when the girl who's like the love interest got scooped. Was it Sarah Jessica Parker? No. She looked like her, though. Like her. But she looked like her. Some other 90s version yeah, of her. But she looked like Sarah Jessica Parker, and that's who Matthew Broderick is married to. Oh, maybe. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if there's a connection. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, what does uh, that mean? The second movie was going to be where this baby imprints on him and it kind of goes from there. Yeah, but it fights monsters for him. Basically. He, um, it's going to be like real steel. If anyone but anyways, real steel where they, they, know. there was a huge theatrical flop. This movie was failed, but they didn't, they didn't toss the story. If you do remember the animated Godzilla movie or Godzilla cartoon um, in the late nineties, uh, that was the plot of that cartoon, which by the way, the cartoon was somewhat successful. I heard the cartoons fucking sick. Never, I've never. Even I, heard I watched of this some thing. of it. Yeah, they made basically Godzilla two into a cartoon. Yeah, it's like an eight, eighteen episodes, something like that. Yeah, what? yeah. Uh, it's the same team that made the Men in Black animated series. And oh, that was extreme, really that was and really good. Ghostbusters. That's quality entertainment. So Did you? It's there in yeah. the universe. You can watch it. You can it. watch it. It's, okay. I think it's on. You can get it on DVD. Anyways, um, segueing back into twenty nineteen with the new Godzilla, which we currently adore. Um, Unanimous. Yeah. Have you seen it, Taylor? 
I didn't want to point it out in the like. Yeah, but you, you'd like just it. Let so you unanimously, we all like Godzilla. We all like it, or we're Taylor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I would probably like it. You can assume that I'd like it. You saw the first one, right? I did. Yeah, and it, it's like dark the whole time, but still, you know, it has some great elements to it. This one is really cool. I saw it with my cousin. I saw it with my cousin Ian, who's a huge Godzilla fan, and basically but, afterwards, if I had enjoyed it at all, he just tore the whole thing apart for me. So then, oh, I, please I, bring I, him wait, on. I'd love wait. to talk. He he didn't peer pressure you to watch this. The second one? Yeah. No. It's funny because the only complaint I have with the new one is that there are scenes when Godzilla walks in the water and he like walks to them and they're in like a, they're basically in like a submarine and he's walking to them. But we know the ocean is far deeper than his height and he's like torso up. So that means he's like paddle legging and you don't see that at all. And it looks really fucking weird. It's like, how is he walking in the water? He's so fucking. He does have atomic monster breath powers so he's 119 <laughs> meters tall in this movie i looked it up what's a meter a meter is like i'm about three feet so what's that how many he's like 300 that? feet tall it's like 300 it's 350 yeah. feet tall right and some change Wait, 190 meters yeah so that means he's almost like fucking 500 meters tall no he's like 600 meters tall. he's very no, he's, he's 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 390 feet tall he's as tall as the london eye he is exactly did you see the thing well, I, I, just, knew, I just knew that. Oh, Kong wow. is only <laughs> Kong is only eighty two feet tall. Okay, so, so or that we're gonna get to the, the initial okay, topic. Yeah, 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 so we also like two years ago they had. No, you're just gonna keep talking about other shit. The so, whole fucking episode. You're on track though. Uh, yeah. So Kong Skull Island come out what two years ago? Yep. And um, so Kong Skull Island is based in the forties, right? The forties. Mm. Vietnam. 60s. Oh wait, so we're this Kong Skull Island is part of. This universe. This universe. Do your homework, Taylor. Yeah, so Taylor, but, but I thought that I thought that this was supposed to be a direct sequel to the Godzilla movie, Monarch. not the Kong movie. There's like this shield analog called Monarch that they use to like thread the needle in all their movies. Okay. So it's like a monster observance and and preservation so, and study society. Skull Island does not take place in the 30s. Skull Island takes place modern day. Although no, it no, was Skull Island in takes 70s. place in 60s. 60s, 70s. Well, yeah. although it was there in the 30s because in Kong Skull Island, they say that, you know, the World War II or World War One pilots crashed there. Oh. And, World War One. Uh, World War One, And uh, he eventually makes it back to his family. Um, but anyways, in Two. Godzilla 2, um, Monarch displays 19 known kaijus and Kong is on the map. They know about him. Oh. And, they show uh, Skull Island on the map. So Kong is only about 100 feet tall. In less. Kong Skull Island, but it's based in the 60s. So he gets bigger. So he's got about another 60 years to grow to get bigger. Yeah, he's going to Applebee's. So uh, Godzilla versus Kong, which is, I don't know when it's slated for. Next year. Next year? It's um, already, they're already filming it. So uh, th they're going to use plot to make Kong big enough to fight Godzilla. Or they use plot to make... I, I honestly, like part of me, because like a lot of the film message boards and stuff, the number one topic is how are they going to bridge the gap between... Stilts, eighty-five platform shoes, eighty-five foot tall Kong, and like three hundred foot tall Godzilla. Nearly four hundred foot. Godzilla. Nearly four hundred foot, exactly. And I'm just like plot. I think that in the shot, Kong is just going to be as tall as Godzilla, and no one's going to care because they bought a ticket to see Godzilla versus Kong. They're going to see it, damn it. Even if he's like slightly shorter, you got to think about Kong. How? But Godzilla has basically superpowers with atomic breath. and Apparently the studio his, wanted him to fight differently than Godzilla. Because Godzilla is like atomic breath, the tail. and He has the atomic explode thing yeah, now. Yeah, limited, very limited upper arm movement. Very limited uh, motor skills. That's what they really wanted to focus Kong on. Kong is very, very, very dexterous. Kong, very Kong, agile. And, Kong, yeah, and, they, and they show a lot of Kong using tools. Using tree trunks and rocks. He uses a lot of tools to fight. And the thing that they're saying is that that's going to give him... The upper hand against Godzilla. A tree trunk against Godzilla. No, but I'm just saying, like, I'm just <laughs> saying, like, real good tree. he took like a he took like an 80 foot tall tree, took it out, took all the leaves off it, and was like, I got a fucking bat. Come to my house, boy. And, and he knocked and, one of the skull thing, skull crawlers yeah, in the and face. He, but the thing is, he's very dexterous, right? Kong is he's very, also very intelligent. Yeah, he's. I mean, they're both pretty intelligent. Like Godzilla has rationale. He's able. He looks at us ant people and knows who we are, which is crazy. That's the one thing that I think is the least. Understandable well, what's cool about this movies. Godzilla movie is they kind of they. I love putting in lore and stuff, and they did a pretty good job of putting that in this movie of like where Godzilla lives, where he's from, how long he's been here, like the ancient civilizations. They kind of dived into that on who worshipped him and how people knew about him for a long time. It's just now that we kind of we're rediscovering all this this knowledge and also like technology that was around Godzilla back in the day. 
and how he like travels. Godzilla technology. They even explain, although it's kind of far fetched, but he they explain in the movie how he travels the Earth so fast. How does he? Um, kind of under, the, the, inter internals like subway. So like you know like the inner Earth theory where it's like things inside the Earth that actually. I exist. didn't know they talk about this. I yeah, love yeah. that the hollow Earth stuff. Yeah, you should have watched. So great. Watch the. Content. I'm gonna. I'm gonna watch it. Watch it. <laughs> we'll in, do. I'll watch in, it. I rewatched in Endgame last night. Yeah. He's listening to this podcast like fuck <laughs> Taylor <laughs> <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> So, um, Godzilla, we wanted to start out on a high note, but to kind of wrap up Godzilla and move on to other monster properties, um, who do you guys think is going to win the uh, Kong versus Godzilla fight? Uh, my bet, you know, if I had to say, like, they're actually going to do that and not cop out and say, like, they both win, I got to say, I feel like they're going to have to give it to Kong. And here's the reason why. Because everyone thinks he's the underdog to such a wide margin he is the underdog that they need to establish his dominance and i think this is going to be the opportunity to do it lex you up max max oh uh i personally don't think either one there'd be a stalemate at least um because i i i think i know who the villains are going to be yeah well, but they, if they have to if they if like the movie has one or the other there's a victor there's not going to be a winner you no, know no, no 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 i'm saying hypothetically if there is a winner in the movie which one do you think they're going to make it? well i mean Kong gets killed by fucking planes. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so like on a, on a he building. He gets killed by a blonde chick. Yeah. I think. And Godzilla was. Twas beauty. Godzilla's only lost like one time. Jack ever. Black was outlived Kong. That's pretty big. And if you, if you look at Godzilla's powers and shit, I think he just needs one upper hand and he wins. I think neither of them will win. I think Plot's going to win because they're going to fight for a minute and then they'll be. Yes, we all know I that. I'm asking said that. you to answer the fucking I question. I just said that and you guys forced me to answer. So you're I know. saying in this hypothetical fight that's not going to end before Act 2, who's going to win? Yes. Godzilla. Right. All, all right. right. Cool. I'm so, putting the smart money on Godzilla. So okay. you heard it here first if this is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it is. We know. We, we got the uh, insider so the, stuff here. The, uh, I believe the villains, Lex said a little bit ago, was either... I don't think it is going to be one of these guys, but he's a big candidate. Is Mecha Godzilla? Because which of, I think it'd be dope. Yeah, because the, the 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 organization that actually is against them it makes big giant robots as well, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the movie, there was a big cliffhanger where they get the DNA of Ghidorah to make their own uh, monster, which could lead to Destroya, which is like a genetically engineered Godzilla monster that fights Godzilla. Um, and he's huge. He's got he's like Godzilla with big claw fingers and bat yeah, I remember him and stuff or i think it could be space godzilla by the way looks pretty badass also great name i think space lex is gonna be the villain this is space godzilla That's google it so dope yeah uh for those at home who don't want to google this right now it looks like he has giant like you know those crystals that people wear there on their necks that make them feel better apparently they're on his shoulders and they're huge it looks yeah, like, like godzilla shoulder with pads. athlete's foot but on his back but he looks very similar to Godzilla. I do not want to see because he's just foot. he's just Godzilla from space. I just want to say, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, is really a sad moment in movie history because they gave the audience exactly what they asked for in Godzilla 2014: more monsters, more fighting, CGI, an incredible marketing campaign. If you go and look at the marketing for that film, they did everything right. They leaned into the characters. They made it very branded. Uh, it was exciting and interesting. No one knew where it was going to end, and people still didn't show up. Uh, I did. I know you and I were both into it. I saw it fucking opening weekend. I saw it twice. Yeah, I, better than most. But for some reason, people just didn't show up. And this summer has been a really they're weird too busy seeing Marvel movies. Exactly. This summer has been a really weird summer. I feel like Endgame kind of took the winds out of a lot of the sales because the people thought a lot of movies were going to be bigger than they MIB, were. man. I was excited for that. I didn't even see it. Well, then you know what the I problem didn't with see MIB the, either. The problem yeah. with MIB is that I heard that the trailers don't even give the good parts away because there are no good parts. Ooh. That's what people said. Like, they're like, oh, like you think the trailers give the good parts away? The reason why the trailers are so shitty is because there are no good parts. Max time. Back to the episode. Okay, so we were talking about Kong and all that stuff, but that was a good movie. Overall liked it. Not enough people saw it, but they're making more, so I'm excited. But we want to talk about failed properties of monster movies, because little do we know. Or all pro yeah, monster uh, so movies. So basically there was like a monster verse they were planning. They tried to make a movie. We can talk about it in a second. But in 2014, 2015, 2016, they were going to have all these different releases of all these new monster movies. So it's really interesting to talk about Godzilla and Kong, which are kaiju films. But we also want to talk about the larger scope of monster movies in Hollywood today. 
you know, Universal created the first ever cinematic universe with their monster movies, their classic monsters, as they call them. Universal's classic monsters. We're talking the Wolfman, Frankenstein, the Mummy, Bride of Frankenstein, uh, I'm trying to think, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. They did a lot of stuff with Lon Chaney. They did stuff with uh, Phantom of the Opera. Dr. These, Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, yeah. you know, famously mixed together in Van Helsing, um, the mummy films of Brendan Fraser. They wanted to start their own interconnected universe, which they had actually premiered back in the 1930s. They wanted to do that called the Dark Universe, not the Monsterverse, the Dark Universe. Dracula Untold came out, I believe, in 2016, 2017, and it did nothing. It didn't do anything for them, but they opened all these release dates in their new Dark Universe. They were supposed to make The Mummy, which came out in 2018. Yeah, 2018. And The Mummy was supposed to be their new start for the Dark Universe. And they had Javier Bardem. They had Angelina Jolie. They, they had, had uh, the guy played... Uh, Dr. Russell, Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, yeah, Russell Crowe was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. They wanted to create a dark universe, which is an interconnected universe, similar to when they first created uh, uh, Abbott and Costello meet the Wolfman. The Mummy was released in 2017, by the way. The Tom Cruise Mummy? Yeah. Oh. Really? Yeah. yeah that uh, long ago? That's surprising. Um, it feels like just yesterday that I didn't go see that movie. <laughs> Not in the theater, at That's least. a great it, joke. I did see it. I did see it. It doubled its money. It's just, it's still... It's yeah, but its marketing costs are the same as its fucking... So it basically made their money back, but they wanted a blockbuster. They yeah. wanted this thing. Like the Brendan this was Fraser going to be the flagship of a whole new thing. It was going to be a, you know, a cinematic universe about monsters. It was going to be an MCU. A monster cinematic universe? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Interestingly enough, people talk about how Jaws in 1974, and then Batman, the 1980s Tim Burton Batman, both for their generations created the concept of a blockbuster. And I think that's a really interesting thought because for me, I was born in 1991, uh, TMI, my first ever understanding of a blockbuster was actually The Mummy Returns because The Mummy was so big in my generation, the Brendan Fraser Mummy, the first one was so big and so massive of a release, I remember Blockbuster had all of the DVD sleeves in front, or the VHS sleeves in the front of their office, in the front of their buildings, and you know you couldn't go anywhere without seeing the Mummy out there, the Brendan Fraser Mummy. Like they took over everything. They were family. They were kids. They were horror. They were they were supernatural. They were you know action. They were adventure. They were every genre, and they were every genre kind of perfectly. That when the Mummy Returns came out, I remember I think I was in fifth or sixth grade, and that was my first understanding of this is a big movie. This is a movie that's going to penetrate. The globe. They kind of there's a, a memory I have because when the first mummy come out, we were still kids. Yeah. So you didn't really attach yourself to how excited we got for in game kind of thing. Oh, I, I saw it after. I saw it on but, VHS. But I my see it in the but my neighbor, his older brother, my neighbor's older brothers who were like 18, 19 at the time, I overheard a conversation of them talking about the mummy that was coming out. And how excited they were. The first one. The first one. And I could, they had the buzz we have for like blockbusters today, and uh, before that, what was there? I mean, you have Jaws, you have Star Wars, you have, you know, the Batman. No, 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 but, but I, I think that this was a special one in the sense that you're right. I mean, to me, it was like, you know, I grew up with Indiana Jones before that, but this was like the first new Indiana Jonesy kind of movie. It was something that it's like, first of all, my mom's like favorite movie of all time. One of my mom's Mommy? favorite movies, The Mummy. Yeah. When I was a kid, it was Brandon Fraser one. It was yeah. scary. It's it was spooky. Absolutely horrifying. You know, one of her favorite lines that she says all the time, like, you know how, like, moms kind of don't use quotes all that well? Yeah. Like, they reuse it. Your she loves the... What? Your mom's a delight. She is a delight. Um, she loves to do the... Uh, what's the what's the guy's... Uh, the, 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 the weird guy with the Benny. fez? Benny. Benny, you're on the wrong side of the river. I knew exactly which one. She she says it all the time, and I'm like, Mom, that is not. There's no context for I that particular line. Looks like I got all the horses. Yeah. My, <laughs> Benny, my, my you're on the wrong side of the river. Um, that's but that's yeah, got to no, be the most quotable line from the film. But I always think when I think of the mummy, I think of the scene where he's like, Sir Imhotep or Lord Imhotep still needs more. Oh, and and the blind guy? Were they taking his tongue? Oh, oh my yeah. God. That's real horrific. spooky. Thanks you for, his, uh, for your eyes. Thanks you for your tongue. But he still needs more. Yeah. How horrific was that? So, uh, you know, let's let's go back to the original thing here and just realize that uh, I saw the new Mommy movie. Um, and did you see the new Mommy movie? Yeah. The, the, yeah. the one? Mm -hmm. You didn't see it. Um, we Besides all saw it. It's not a Marvel was, movie, so I didn't see it. Yeah, that was that was much more recent in our lives. And honestly, I can't remember a single fucking line from that movie. But I can tell you, 
almost verbatim everything from the Brendan I Fraser I can remember movie. that fucking early IMAX release god awful trailer that was not finished sound design wise. Oh yeah, that had like it was like eighteen minutes. It was so fucking long. Did they really the, 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 the plane with the plane crash, no, right? No, no, with no, the plane so, accident. So IMAX accidentally released an unfinished trailer. And it was the trailer, but it had the unfinished sound design. So it just had basic sounds in it for like, for actual sound designers to make stuff. So you had like Tom Cruise going, when he goes out the the plane on the side and he's falling, he goes, ah, oh! and like all these weird noises were happening in the background because it's not sound designed or anything. You're going to put it in post, right? I'll make some sounds. Can you have put like a sample of it in post so we know what we're talking about? I'll put a sample in right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's weird how that works. Nothing is permanent. Your life is a lie. But, but there's been a few <laughs> of these these monster movies, like the Tom Cruise one, um, which I saw it. You know, it's it's fine or whatever. It, I, it but it didn't get me excited for anything more. You know, like what they tried to do with it. And uh, but they, you know, Wait. they're always leaving that any big blockbuster. They leave you trying wanting more. The very end, they try to like set something up. Yeah, it's the game is on moment. Yeah. You know, like in the end of Jekyll Untold, where you see, you know, Charles dance it's in the future. You know, and he walks over and he goes, and the game is on. And the thing is, like, I was actually really excited for Dracula Untold. The, all the trailers and stuff. I thought that movie was awesome. Luke Evans is a fucking delight. Uh, no, like, so Dracula Untold was really great. And I, I love how they kind of like superhero modified that movie where it's kind of the the lore and stuff is there. It's but, an origin story. For, yeah, yeah. And yeah. like, but he's like a superhero, basically. Um, which I saw what they tried to do, but that's kind of what that's kind of what they should be. They should use the Universal Monsters and make them kind of elemental. You know, superhero. you know what they said. So one, one of the one of the producers. executive producers said that, and they tried, and then they failed. The thing right. that that rang false for me about the uh, the Dracula thing is is that there is such a huge mythos behind these characters, and they wanted to re envision all of them as being somewhat good guys. So, like, the Dracula movie, it's like, oh, he became, like, a vampire, but against his will, only to save his family. It's like, this guy is a really cool and complex character, and he's not a good guy. Even the old one, he wasn't a good Interesting. guy. He ate people. You you make a really good point. It was like a rogues gallery of villains that kind of came together, maybe did something cool, but they didn't have the backbone to do that. So, even the mummy, they were like, well, she was, you know... Not so bad, really. She I just wanted to just love somebody the whole time. Yeah, I exactly. It, I mean, it, Imhotep wanted that too. He wanted to get laid. I know, but Imhotep was a real. I mean, I, I don't think Imhotep really knew what he was in store the curse. for. Curse! It's real. Like, it's real. The curse, dude. Ruling the world nowadays a lot different. Like yeah. you know, back in your day, you just had Egypt, but like nowadays, you have like people wouldn't like really taxing and trade yeah, policy yeah, yeah. and all that shit. Like you know, you're you have to like deal with Trump and shit. Yeah, but who cares <laughs> like, if you've got sand powers? <laughs> who yeah. cares if you have sand powers? Well, we'll rule everything. No, but I wonder. I can make my face in a giant cloud of sand. Like, we'll, what we'll, else do we'll, you want? We rule everything. Sand the light, face. The light, 2020. We rule everything. Sand face 2020. <laughs> we rule everything. The light touches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I wonder. <laughs> I wonder kingdom. if they made like not horror, but like thrillers with all these characters, and made them even like super heroic, where they're like elemental, right? So like Frankenstein, you have like strength and electricity. Right. The mummy, you have like sand, heat, decay. Right. You have like, you know, the wolf man where he's very feral and very, you know, has like brute strength and he's, he's got razor sharp things. And there there are movies about people surviving these people. And then they do like a mashup, like an Avengers thing. And they actually do have to do something cool. And I'm not saying like do it corny, like lean into the thriller, lean into like the whatever aspect of it. I wonder if that would have been a more successful. Approach. So what you're you know trying what, to though? Like, you, sorry, go ahead. But what you're trying to say is Van Helsing almost got it right. Van Helsing got a lot of things right. I thought that was that was the first time. Van Helsing is the first movie that I thought, hey, this is a good movie. And then I saw it a second time, I'm like, this is a really bad movie. That's the first movie that I ever turned around on. I will say, when I was when I watched it the first time, this fight between Van Helsing and Dracula was pretty badass. Oh, and also I gotta say, I agree with the first version of you and then not the second one because I still love that movie. Well, it's it's one of those sort of like I've you know it's one of those things when I'm looking for something to watch and I'm going through like what's on HBO go or on, you know, like Netflix, something like that. Like if that movie's on there, I'd be like, all right, fuck it. I'll, I'll watch. I'll they, did they, of, they did a lot of creative things. They tried like, to the, like werewolves ripping their skin off to transform. That's a really inspired decision. They also did what Taylor said. Dracula should have been. He was a bad guy. Yeah. Dracula in this movie was terrible. I, I honestly, he was a very bad guy. Yeah. I see Dracula as kind of like a Dr. Doom analog. And now we're three for three on Doom references in the show. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Doom. Yeah. All hair, Lord Doom. All hair, Lord Doom. Let Varia. Um, 
Live Barry 2020. Doom 2020. Doom 2020. Oh, t-shirt idea. T-shirt idea. T-shirt idea. I'll wear it. I think there's already shirts. No, no, no. no. But but, but that's the thing is is that I think they could have done a better job with this Dark Universe thing if they had embraced the kind of anti-hero angle more. They didn't want to do that at all. They They wanted it to be these kind of characters who were just like, you know, re-envisioning of classic characters that we all already know and have like a very strong connection to emotionally. And they wanted to eliminate all of that, rebrand them as being like these, you know, happy meal kind of like good guy characters in secret. And that's that's never going to work. No it's, one's ever going to want it's that. It's basically G.I. Joe of monsters. It's like, this is your sand soldier. This is your electricity soldier with so, Frankenstein. It's like they're all just... They want to make them kind of cookie cutter and templated. So we're still leading to Van Helsing was great because even Frankenstein and or excuse me, well it's not Frankenstein. What, what's he called? Um, in the Frankenstein's movie? monster. The Frankenstein's monster? monster. He wanted to die the whole time. Have He's you like, guys, kill me? No, no, no. You know? But no, we're not. We haven't even talked about the perfect mashup of Penny Dreadful. No, 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 no. Come on, guys. Monster Squad. No. Although great reference. The perfect match. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Come on, guys. <laughs> that shit show. Are you that, kidding me? We're talking about movie. incredible B it's movies. A terrible movie. Oh, it's a terrible movie. I just don't the think you guys have an appreciation for man. shitty movies the as much as I man. do. Oh, no, I do. Gremlins 2 is one of my favorite movies. Gremlins 2 is not a shitty movie. It's a, it's like it's fine. an auteur's dream. Oh, fine, fine. What's the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he's Turbo Man? Oh, Jingle All the Way. That's a shitty movie, but that's a great that's movie. That's not the same thing. We're, I, mean, I think we're I, talking different like kinds of shitty movies. The League of Extraordinary German, Gentlemen, when I first saw it, I was a kid, and I Captain loved Nemo it. Nemo on that, sh- that... Rewatching it. Rewatching it's so Rewatching it as an adult, it doesn't hold up super well. Back to back to Universal Monsters, you know, they have the golden goose. These are characters that are elemental. They're well-defined. They're in the popular culture. People understand who they are. They have a lot of, you know, recurrence. These are characters that they may, the rumor is, the rumor just broke out this morning that Universal is opening another theme park in Orlando, and one of the themed lands is going to be themed to the classic monsters as they were originally depicted. They can do so many great things and create an interconnected franchise, they just need to stop making it the Avengers. You know, um, because a part of me, like, thinks, like, how could we regroup and solve this mystery of how to make successful movies with monsters, but to be honest with you, it's just kind of confusing. Like I can, I'm sort of confused on like what's been made and, well, and what direction they could take it and to make it successful. Like, like superhero movies are so straightforward; they're so mm. easy to relate to and make you feel good. But monster movies, like what connect? Of course, like the Bride of Frankenstein was a huge property in the 30s. But like, what connects me to her as a character? That's a really interesting thought. Yeah, and actually, that brings up a good point. Comparing it one to one with the. Uh, with the comic books of today is that maybe that's the reason why that was the interconnected universe at the time is that this is all property. I mean, you know, Bram Stoker's Dracula came out. I don't know when that was a long time ago. And Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, all of these characters are like well known within literature, the literature, but also like the collective unconscious of everyone in that world. So it's like the idea of bringing them together was really cool in the exact same way that comic books did that. And the MCU did that where they're just like, Hey, you know, it'd be really great. Everyone loves Iron Man. This Iron Man movie really did really well. Wouldn't it be great if we did like Thor with him too, you know, like, and that was that idea. So I think that maybe it's not so much that, you know, trying to make that happen now is an impossibility it's that it kind of happened back then and it was because those were the characters at the time now we have the comic book movies i don't know what it's going to be the next time but you know i guarantee 20 30 years we're going to see some other franchise that's you know it's going to be like the degrassi kids with you know cgi well, 90210 people or well, something like um, that like the thing is like when you put thor and iron man in a movie it's really easy for them to have a common goal like Thanos is a shithead. Stop him. And we all want to stop this guy. But like, what common goal can you make for monster characters? But they didn't do that in the old movies. What Penny Dreadful did it really well. The, the, well, yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is that in the past, that wasn't the objective. It was exactly. like like the Wolfman meets the mummy was basically like, okay, we're going to have, you know, uh, Abbott and Costello run away from them in fear. Like, that was that was basically it. That was the objective. I mean, that's what they tried to do with the Mummy reboot. Like, Tom Cruise basically gets superpowers at the end. 
Yeah, but they, so he could be the new mummy. But that's the thing is that they wanted to switch it. They wanted he to would, make a superhero horror character movie series, mm-hmm. but that was blending two different concepts together. That I don't and think worked. That's together. why it doesn't work. That's why it doesn't work. Um, because like the mummy, we solved it. Well, no, I wonder if you can make a movie where they solve, they save the world, but they. I wonder if you can make a movie where they save the world, but they don't. They don't care about people. What if they're they're just as hazardous to regular people, but they save the world? Like they're kind of like forces of nature, similar to like Godzilla. Well, that depends on the character. Like I feel like, like Frankenstein, Wolfman, Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster would be a force of nature that would work for the world, but Dracula should never be a good guy. Yeah, but maybe Dracula's the one manipulating all of them. Yeah, the big twist in the third film, maybe. Yeah, but again, going back to him being a doom analog. Yeah. But I think a big attachment, like one of the reasons Brendan Fraser's mummy was so successful is that we were attached to him and not the actual mummy. The mummy was the bad guy. And we had this hero character that we could relate to, actually, that is like saving the world, kind of like the Indiana Jones kind of thing. And it's... It, it Ooh. Was, it, uh, what if we take the same group of people and put them against every single character and then do a match where the character, all the villains are in the same movie? Like, you know, Van Helsing had some success because Van Helsing was the main character. And he and they put in the monsters as, like, side characters and bad guys. Obstacles. And obstacles. And that's it's easier to relate to monsters in that way because they're monsters. They're not the main characters. They're they're the, the, the bad guy you're against or, you know... The, the, Titans, the antagonist, the fight. antagonist, right? That's the word, yeah. But, I mean, if they could introduce a new party, a character that we can relate to, like the hero-esque pinnacle character, like a like a, like a a Brendan Fraser type person that can interact Played in this by universe. Tom Cruise. It's a, well, Tom Cruise is the mummy. That's the problem. Yeah. He becomes the mummy in the end, and that's kind of weird. Like, he should have just defeated the mummy and moved on to, like, the next big topic. So so then, okay, in this scenario that you're talking about, is it a situation where you're going to have um, the protagonists fighting against the title character, which be it the mummy, Frankenstein, or whatever, Dracula, and then you have the protagonists who are not the top build character all get together and do like an adventure style thing? Because they're Why not... does it even have to be an adventure style thing? Well, but, but they're not... I mean, I love Brendan Fraser, and I think he was it could a really be like good an escape example. room thing. A what? An escape room? Like they're they're in like they have all. No, these no, no. But I'm saying that they're like these aren't the like Brendan Fraser is a good example of like one situation where he is a great character, but you have to basically build a hero squad off of their villains, I which mean, is an inversion of the way things have been done. Or you could build a universe around a new character who's like just a human. Take like a Laura Croft or something, and she goes and defeats the Wolfman, and then like the the big cliffhanger is you find out it's not just a universe with just the Wolfman. There's a universe filled with other things. Oh my god, I fucking love this. What? That's and so good. Yeah, it's like that's so good. But like yeah. you know, the big cliffhanger is like just like at the end of um, uh, Godzilla, you you find you see Kong Kong Skull Island on the map. You're like, oh my god, Kong's in this universe. It's like you see like. The place where Dracula lives. Castle of Dracula. Yep. Yeah. And you see all these things on this map, and she's been marking. And it, let's make it a woman hero this time, you know? It's, I, that's the love Laura Croft. I know it can't be yeah. Laura Croft, but it's a Laura Croft type character. But yeah. it, it brings in that, like, lore, discovery, Indiana Jones thing we all always love. Oh, you my God. You made me think of so something. Good. So, in this beginning of this movie, Laura Croft type character is chasing somebody for burglary. Turns out it's the Invisible Man. She imprisons him. She catches him. Later in the movie, she has to go back to him to help him. But her science bro the entire time has been working on a formula. Got a science bro. You have she to has have a one. science bro who's been working on a formula, but it's not complete. And he, it, it only sort of alludes to it, but towards the end of the movie, he completes his stuff. He turns out to be uh, Hyde. Hyde. And he turns into the monster guy. He was a good guy the whole time, but he just been a science bro the, the whole time. The science bro is, oh my God, that's amazing. And then the werewolf, I love and that. And the werewolf attacks Hyde and saves her. And I was, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, no. But the thing that I wanted to say was that I love this. I think that all of this is incredible. I can so see this whole but, series. But, but the other thing I was saying is that we can create such like a cool, like I'm thinking sort of John Wickian sort of like yeah. parallel sort of like she's, I feel like she's not just someone who like is hunting monsters, but like, 
you know, she knows plenty of people who she are these. She has her own backstory. She's and her got her motives. Back, but not, but also like there's this whole world that she's been a part of. Like she knows where to find the invisible guys. But with, like she knows that neighbor. I would love if like there's like this interconnected mythos and there's a whole group of people who know it and the audience is being introduced it through an introductory character. Yeah. And that's interesting to me because then you can let the characters be the characters and let the plot unfold however the screenwriters want and they don't have to terraform anything. They don't have to make the mummy a hero, superhero. They don't have to make Frankenstein a superhero. They can just, oh, we need someone, we need someone to come in, fucking break this wall and then, it's, you know, establish deep regret and it's Frankenstein. But at the monster. same time, you, know, you could do that, you know? The writers yeah. also know when to write in like a, a, a character, most of these characters stand the test of time, but somebody like Jekyll and Hyde, you can rewrite him brand new as a new character. Oh, like who you can stretch? Who 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 appeared in 2019? Yeah. Like her science bro became Hyde in 2019. Yeah, yeah. and it's the same thing with like... Dracula's uh, been here the whole time. Right, Yeah. You know. exactly. He's got a big thing. It's sort of like what we were talking about like Baron Zemo and stuff. It's like, yeah, yeah you can change that character. Like no one's upset Bull, about it. Bullseye. No one cares. Bullseye. No one cares. Master. No one cares. Yeah. Like yeah. He, he, as long as they like, have the same kind of thing. Like, and you're absolutely right. Like, if the science bro... But that's what Penny Dreadful did. And I feel like none of you guys have seen that show. Have we and just been describing Penny Dreadful this whole time? Basically. Oh, Penny Dre- basically the whole, the whole plot of Penny Dreadful is there's this character that's very similar to Alan Quartermain. Uh, he's uh, Professor Harker. His daughter, Mina Harker, was kidnapped by the vampires. And he's the one person who understands that the occult and supernatural are real. There is like in the second season, there's like these witches. In the third season, you know, um, there's Bride of Frankenstein, who's a main character in the first season who dies. Like, the creature finds and, and reanimates. And it's like. Every single thing happens, but it happens in ways that just make you more interested in the world. It's not trying to be an Avengers movie. It's just trying to be its own thing. And it's a really interesting show. And I feel like more people should have saw it. The creature is incredible. Rory Kinnear plays the creature. And Eva Green does her fucking best. Victor Frankenstein is crazy good. Like, every character is amazing. All right, so uh, we're kind of getting to the point where Universal just kind of needs to hire us. Mm-hmm. But we want to kind of wrap up this idea. Where do we take this story? And what me and Taylor and Lex were talking about is... Um, well, we were talking about the um, the exposition character and learning about this world as they go. Interconnected group of hero characters. We're fought like this, this Tomb Raider-esque character. She's discovering this universe with... Like, we're discovering with her. Like this is not something that is brand new, but there's a mythos behind it. Like there's, I haven't seen one universe, like big monster movie where they start to discover mythos that I don't like it. Yeah. I the always only, love that. The only thing I'd say is that I'd want the Tomb Raider character to know about this already. And they can be like another character that she's introducing it to like the sidekick kind of person, so the, this the, is, the initiate. So this is kind of like, the Tomb Raider is basically a remade version of Alan Quartermain, who's been around the block a mm-hmm. bunch, and her side, her side character, her, her, um, her apprentice, if you would say, is discovering the magic. The same, the same thing, like we highly like we love about MIB, where they discover this whole new universe. Yep, and uh, they get wrapped in, and Kay is teaching him so much stuff along the way. Yeah. And uh, we get wrapped up in this monster universe where they can bring in monsters as we go. And we talk about how um, Laura K. Quartermain is going to be her name. Real on the nose. She's the daughter. She's the daughter. And uh, of all three of them, weirdly. Yeah. No, I, I, I see exactly what you oh, mean. No, I know. No. So, so in this universe, like the, the we know where to rewrite characters for a new age like a Jekyll and, or Jekyll and Hyde, like they could rewrite that character. At the same time, there's characters that have been around for hundreds of years, like Dracula, who are they're, they're s- the solidarity of their character is still there. And they can revamp certain characters for a new audience um, versus attaching us to like the Bride of Frankenstein, which is a, a fundamental character. It's awesome. But like in reality, who really cares that much? You can mm-hmm. you you guys crack the code because you could have a character, right? You could have, say you have a character who's like a Tomb Raider analog, right? And She's the the viewpoint of this world. And in the first movie, right, her, like, best friend dies because she takes her on a mission she shouldn't have been on, right? And then the, like, second or third movie, like, that's the Broad of Frankenstein. They reanimate her. It's like, it's like you can do so many things if you just take the core elements of the character's origin and tie it into an interconnected universe. These characters don't need to be protagonists. They don't need to be antagonists. They just need to exist and create plot for the characters that we care about to experience. And 
But like I said, I'm a big fan of like the wolf man coming in and saving the day indirectly because he's an animal. He's an animal. He's not there to be have motives. Maybe the character who transforms into the wolf man has very compelling arc, very sympathetic arc, but that's bullshit. We don't care about that. We I mean it's interesting. It's window dressing, but what I'm saying is how cool would it be if like Castle Dracula opens up and all these vampires come out and there's only one that comes through the fucking crevice and they're all hiding in the cave and the last minute over the hill comes the fucking wolf man and he kills one of the vampires so they have a room to escape. Like that that character is a plot device, but it's a plot device that exists within the social context of who we know that character is. And you know the wolf man fucks the Laura Croft character. Like that's up that that there's charming, there's the trying the, the charming guy. Well, you know but, that'd be interesting. What if the what if the Larry Croft character had like a a boyfriend and stuff and finds out that he's the Wolfman later on? Like you can do so many things where there's a lot of plot twists that doesn't change the nature of these characters. Yeah. Okay. I uh, I have a closing thing. Uh, whenever you, I'm ready, you guys, I'm ready. Uh, one one thing is like you mentioned the Dracula thing. There's a great an- a scene from actually how to train your dragon where like they're just trying to kill all these dragons and there's this one giant dragon who's like an analog for Dracula who rules them all mm-hmm. and they can't beat him until the one pivotal character somebody who's just a human and his befriended dragon or whatever the night fury the night fury can defeat this larger dragon um and uh but there's so many things you could draw on from how cinema is working today to make these characters successful. And you could do Dracula things like they did with Loki, where like later on he's an anti-hero. Yep. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it just ties into his ego and his confidence. So you could do all these things, but you just need to stick to what makes his character works, what makes his character work work. Tell a compelling story about non like universal monster characters, and then make these characters kind of the dressing around it. I feel like that would be way more compelling. Because if I made a movie, right? Universal is Halloween Horror Nights. And they have these haunted houses. It's a four-story haunted house. The first floor is the Redwood Forest where they fight, where you like survive against the wolf man. You walk through Redwood, for- Redwood Forest. You smell the pine trees. You walk in the dirt. You smell the dirt. You're in, you can't see anything in front of you. There's the moon in the distance. You hear the howling, right? You, there's, there's an abandoned log cabin with the doors boarded up. And every now and then you hear like a growl. And you, you're like, fuck, I got to get out of here. Get to the next floor, there's a fucking laboratory, the electrodes going off, things exploding, sparks in your face, electric fences, right? And that's where Franken's is coming alive. You walk past the cadaver and the cadaver rises up, right? This shit's fucking horrifying. You don't want to sympathize with those characters some of the time. Some of the time you just want to be afraid of them and let them be the forces of nature that they are. Similar to the Joker in The Dark Knight, right? You don't want to know why he actually has the scars. You want it to be multiple choice because it's more compelling that way. Same thing with The Predator. The Predator in Alien Alien vs. Predator or the Predator film, the more you know about him, the less interesting he is. If you just let him be a force of nature that people have to contend with, he's a much more compelling character. Um, And that's like, so we make a hero character we can relate to that kind of works in movies today, but at the same time... Or a squad of them or whatever. Squad or whatever, but we relate to, because they're people. There's human beings we can relate to with troublesome lives and whatnot. But then you let the characters be what they're supposed to be from... All. Yeah, but also make changes as relevant. You know, like, yeah, right. like having a character, right? Maybe one of the squad is the wolf man. You yeah. Even know it. You and, know? Also, and also the idea that it's like, yes, they are these characters, but they don't have to just necessarily be evil. Like, let them... Like that's the problem with the mummy going going back. And I feel like we're, we're running around in circles now saying the same thing, is that this is the problem that... that the other ones it is that they try to force these characters that we know as being like the bad guys into somehow being good guys. They need to earn that and they could do that on screen. So the question that I wanted to ask, and I think that this is going to be a good kind of end cap for this is when do we set it? A release? No, no time period. Time period uh, today. Yeah. I say today that makes the most sense. It follows the analog of what the story we're creating. You did 20, 30 years ago. Get a kick ass soundtrack. Yeah. You could do that. I was thinking, I was I mean, thinking, that's not bad either. I was thinking that you could do like a, uh, you could do a, um, you can do a Stranger Things and have in the 80s. I'll do a little Stranger Things, you know, a little Stranger Things. I love the Stranger Things. Yeah, do oh, a little, yeah, the, success. little Toto by a little, little synth wave little fucking to- yeah. s- soundtrack. But that's just like what we just talked about pulling narratives that really work today. 
picking the time period. Clearly, the eighties. Yeah, is big. but like, you how can't cool, smoke in how, those movies how now. How cool but. would it be? <laughs> how cool would it be if you had like a character that you've introduced sometimes as like the hero, the human character, like maybe the most vulnerable, maybe the most meek character, right? Like a Lewis Tully from Ghostbusters type character, and he's the Wolf Man. And he starts transforming, and you hear like you're really obsessed with this wolf man. Uh, he's my favorite character. Yeah, you yeah, really are. Right. And, you, he says, and you have like Maniac, right? By uh, who's that? Who who plays? Who does the song Maniac? Like she's a maniac, me. Like who like knows? on the floor. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know. Yeah, Before my so time, like, but I do know the song. Yeah, but that song's like playing, and it's like you watch him transform. It's like that's a fucking really compelling synth wavy yeah. song, and it's like that. I feel like would kind of um permit permeate the popular culture like that's right. something you'd remember so we have yeah. a plan make a hero character or group revamp these characters for when appropriate and also put it in the 80s or maybe the 80s put a maybe good another you could do the 90s you could do all you do something else you could but do sugar ray it's all sugar ray music I, no i <laughs> i will walk i will walk sugar ray and smash if, mouth if with a little bit of a little bit of smashing pop all right. Okay. all right so guys this was another episode of the recipe Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening in. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Recipe Boys. That is spelled B-O-Y-Z. And check the description in this episode for more links to information on us. Thank you for leaving us a great review. I'd really appreciate it. I want to read it. It's so good. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. I want yeah, of time. Yeah, thank you for reading. Thank you for writing the great review because I'm going to read it next week. <laughs> next week, if we have any reviews, I'm going to read them. And uh, I'm going to read them out loud. I'm going to comment to them. I'm that's gonna a great right, idea. I'm going to talk right into your ear holes. Me personally. And then... If there's more than one review, we're each going to take a turn. That That's, sounds awesome. Yeah, I'll pick whichever and, uh, review I like, and you guys take the rest. And within our description, there's a link called Linktree, where you can find every bit of information on the podcast. Links to everything you need to know about Can us. they find photos of us? If they wanted to, yes. Mm. It connects to our Twitters, so, you know. We're handsome men. But mm-hmm. That's it for today. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you next time. Peace. Bye.